60,000 people try out for Shark Tank every year. And from that group, only 100 get the CTV. Welcome to the Let's Talk Business podcast, a project of the PTEX Group. Gain valuable, actionable ideas from the world's top business leaders to help you take the next step in your business journey. And now, here is your host, Manny Hoffman. Coming to you from the PTEX headquarters in Brooklyn, New York. This is the podcast for no-nonsense advice to help you learn, grow, and lead. Today, I'm so excited to welcome our guest, Maury Shawaki. In this episode, Maury shares his experience of being in the Shark Tank. We deep dive into the gritty realities of entrepreneurship, revealing the relentless drive and passion required to turn dreams into reality. Maury candidly discusses the delicate balance between work and personal life, drawing insights from industry icons like Kevin O'Leary and Mark Cuban. He also discusses the pivotal role of authentic relationship and the art of seizing opportunities as Maury recounts his partnership with Damon John. Through personal advocacies, he highlights the importance of authenticity and networking in building a thriving business. As we wrap up, Maury reflects on personal growth, sharing his inspiration to become a better father and the invaluable lessons learned along his entrepreneurial journey. Without further ado, let's get right to our conversation with Maury. Maury, thank you so much for joining me on the Let's Talk Business podcast. You're welcome, Manny. Thank you for having me. So we spoke off air. Um, th- we've been going, going back and forth and get, getting, getting this scheduled. I know that you have a very, very busy schedule. So thank you so much for making the time uh, to meet with us and, and for our listeners. You're welcome. For our listeners um, that don't know anything about you, obviously you have a, a, a very, va- like a very um, diverse background and what you've done. And ultimately, I picked up when I started following you when you actually went on Shark Tank to actually share about your business and now eventually you actually now working with Damon John as a show, as as part of his team so we'll get to the full story for our listeners just give us the like the the short version of of your life story the short version of my life story oh my all right well born in mexico city uh my father uh was a incredibly well to do entrepreneur um lived all over the world um and uh, Mexico City is where I ended up. And then when I was three years old, I moved to Los Angeles. You know, I was always uh, I was always an entertainer. I was always somebody who liked to get a reaction out of people. That was something that fueled me. So in fact, um, in high school, I uh, really started focusing on acting. That was kind of a passion of mine. But my father always had a, you know, a thing about business, no matter how successful he was. You know, I was balancing his checkbook at 10 years old. And I never understood why he put me to work in his furniture showroom selling furniture when I was 12. Wow. And uh, I, I, I kind of took off in theater. I decided then to go to college. I went to um, uh, UC San Diego and I majored in theater. Um, and then when I was 17 years old, everything changed. Um, my father, after being, you know, extraordinarily successful, you know, I grew up in Beverly Hills, had the most amazing life. Um, but my father lost uh, his fortune when I was 17 years old. And so, you know, I went from, you know, silver to brass overnight and, you know, then had to figure things out. Um, and so I worked my tail off. I decided not to come home. I worked my way through college, you know, without his help, um, working in restaurants at four in the morning, slinging, you know, deli meat and doing what I needed to do. Graduated in three and a half years. In 94, I went back to LA. I decided to, um, you know, get into, you know, do what I could to get into the acting world. I did professional cartoon voices for uh, about three or four years. But then I fell into an entrepreneurial uh, opportunity that never I could have expected. I uh, became one of the co-founders of the very first e-commerce company that sold health products back in 1994 and back on Prodigy CompuServe and AOL. We had an incredible run. We sold, we exited before the bust in 99, which was amazing, which is really what started my entrepreneurial journey. Then I spent about 10 years at a massive pharmaceutical company um, selling, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of vitamins and OTCs. And that's really where I got my, my business education. That was my MBA over there. And then from there, I spent about another 10 years, uh, you know, selling software then went on Shark Tank back in 2012, made a deal with Damon, um, which now ended up, you know, turning into the career I have now. So that's kind of professionally. 
from a business, you know, from a personal standpoint, you know, I was married for about 22 years. I have three amazing, beautiful adult children. And now I'm about to get married again to uh, my soulmate and very uh, cool. start all over. So it's, I'm, I'm very lucky and I, I, I wake up with a smile and appreciation, you know, every single day. Beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Um, I, I want to go back to what you started off with when you mentioned about uh, your upbringing. And then you mentioned the part of, of, of somehow the, the entrepreneurial bug, so to speak, uh, <laughs> came across. First of all, does, does that have any, any connection be, based on your upbringing and what your, what can you share about that? You know, in America, you know, at least in my generation, we went to high school, you know, we went to grade school and, you know, we had a home economics class that taught us how to sew a pillow and a button. And, you know, we had wood shop and we had one economics class in high school. But, you know, kids don't I mean, I look at my own kids who are in their 20s. They have no ideas, you know, when it comes to money. They don't know, you know, how taxes work. They don't know how, you know, what liabilities and assets are. They don't know, you know what to do with a dollar when it goes into their bank account. My father, as successful as he was, and when I say successful, I mean, I grew up in a, you know, 15,000 square foot house in Beverly Hills with a tennis court and a swimming pool and summers in Monte Carlo and all that. As wealthy as he was and as, as many resources as he had, you know, sitting in his office when I was 10 and he hands me, you know, it's so funny. I still have them to this day the same way. Like all my bills, he like, you know, keeps like this, right? In a little stack, you know, and, you know, he had me go through each of them and write the checks out and balance the checkbook. I never knew why. You know, when he was, when I was 15, he put me to work in a bank. You know, I didn't need the money at that time. And, you know, he just called one of his friends up and said, I need you to employ him. And, you know, that it, it, it gave me not only the education and the experience, but it also helped me understand what finances really are and financial intelligence. And I don't think that we give young people enough. I mean, we give them all the tools to figure out how to build, you know, different things and to play games and this and that. But how much time do we actually give our children on financial investing, education, interest, you know, taxes, what to do, you know, with, with certain investments? I think that is just you know, that was always a very important part of my father's and he's passed away now about 15 years ago, but it was always such an important part. And I, you know, without that, I don't think I would have had the, the, the head for it, you know? Sure. It's, it, it's so, it's so true. And I would say I, I even go a step further is that to a certain extent, we spoil our kids and we handing them almost everything they request for. And we don't, we don't teach them that growth mindset. There's no better, there's no better education than adversary. You know, and, and, you know, I think, you know, having been on that high until I was 17 and then losing everything was really the thing that changed it for me because, you know, Damon John, the guy I work with, wrote a book called Power of Broke. There's really nothing better. When you don't have two rocks to rub together, you figure out how to make a fire using aluminum, you know, and that's entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship comes out of adversity innovation comes out of adversary, you know, so very important. Yeah. So, so talk to us about that uh, period in life when, when, you know, you went from having everything to ultimately um, uh, seeing that uh, your father losing everything and then figuring out that, Hey, I need to start making things on my own. Um, what could you tell us about that period in your life? How much that prepared you for what you're doing today? Oh yeah. I mean, well, first of all, I never could have prepared for it. You know, I was uh, away for my first, you know, time at, at college, you know, about to live the life and, you know, enjoy, you know, kind of carefree and get to do what I needed to do and fully paid for and everything. And then, you know, I get a call one night that changes it all. And it was the call wasn't, hey, I've lost it all and I'm going to help you stay there. The call was I've lost it all. I've had to give up your two dogs that you've loved for eight years because we don't have the house anymore. Oh, wow. You didn't get to say goodbye to them. And oh, by the way, uh, we don't have the money to support you over there anymore. So come home. Wow. And between the anger I had for getting rid of my poor dogs, you know, the, the anger and the resentment I had for being the youngest of five kids who didn't get to have all the spoils, you know, think of the spoils that everybody else got that I didn't get. 
And when they said, come home, that was, that was, I grew up 10 years in one day and I said, I'm not coming home. I just got here. Literally, I was just there two weeks and I said, I'm not coming. And they said, well, we can't afford it. I said, I'll figure it out. And so I spent the next two years, you know, I got my theater degree, my bachelor's and, um, you know, I spent every day from four to, you know, eight in the morning, cutting meat in the deli from, you know, 10 in the morning until four in the afternoon, you know, going to class. And then, uh, you know, from four to seven doing homework and from seven to 11 in rehearsal for all the productions I was in. And, you know, I will also say that theater is something every person in business should look into because it gives you an amazing, amazing sense of understanding of relationship, of reaction, how to pivot and stage presence which we all need for presentation, you know, if we're, if we're doing, you know, if we're pitching anybody. Got it. Um, um, we'll come back to that because I think this is important. We'll speak about the pitch, but I want to ask you one more question about the past when we speak about entrepreneurship, because it, it ties into what you're seeing every single day working with Damon, um, which is a lot of people are ready for entrepreneurship. Why some people will use entrepreneurship as an excuse, but they're not ready for real entrepreneurship. It, it sounds so sexy to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. You know, it sounds so amazing. Oh, I get this life. I get to solve problems. I get to do what I want, go where I What people don't talk about is how many times you have to fall, how many times you're, you're not sure where the next dollar is coming from, let alone to take care of your own bills. You know, if you're an entrepreneur who's lucky enough to build a business and have a staff, you know, we're thinking about paying everybody else before us. We're thinking about taking care of everybody else's health before ours. You, you can't be sensitive when it comes to entrepreneurship. It's, it's one of the most rewarding things on the planet, but it's also one of the hardest. Do you feel that based on your experience now that there are people just, they're, they're not made to be entrepreneurs? Is there something that you could share with our listeners, like a certain trade or criteria that you feel, you know, you're just not ready yet? I don't know that it's something that you are or aren't ready for yet or at any given time. You know, the difference between a entrepreneur and an entrepreneur is, you know, the entrepreneur and the entrepreneur both have that fantastic idea when they're in the shower or they're sitting at the kitchen table. The entrepreneur is the one that will do anything it takes to get it done, that will start dialing for dollars, that will start going to their friends, that will start pitching their friends, that will start pitching their family, that will start calling whoever they know in the industry to help them. I run into so many people who say, oh, I have an amazing idea. Oh, I have an amazing patent. Oh, I have an amazing this. I just need somebody to take it to the next level. Well, nobody gave Edison a million dollars. He, he invented the light bulb, you know, then he went out and he, he proved it. And then, you know, some big companies decided to license it. So the smart entrepreneurs also, you know, figure out how to do what they're doing as a side hustle while they're still making money over here so that they can, you know, live and breathe. My product that I went on Shark Tank with was a very small little niche kind of gift item, but I still, during that time period, I was working full time. I was working on my side hustle, you know, five hours a day. I was sleeping four hours a day at most. And to be quite honest, that lifestyle affected my family. You know, it is, it is gotta be what you do first and foremost and nothing can stop you. It's, it's, you know, so I, I would say you're either, I don't know, it's something that you can, you can turn into. You have to have that drive no matter what you do. Even if you are working as let's say a corporate employee, if you're a nine to fiver, that's not for you. If you're a guy who's in there and is pounding until the people, the janitor says, go home, you know, that's, it's just about drive. It doesn't matter what education, he who works harder than the next is going to be the one that wins. Um, just that reminds me that there's a lot of controversy. Like, uh, I think it was Kevin, Kevin O'Leary that he speaks about the hustle of, of uh, entrepreneur that you have to give away everything. <laughs> Why you, and there's a lot of, you know, chit chat on social media whenever he, sp he speaks about the topic. Is it only this or could you be an entrepreneur and set boundaries? I think you can, but you better have, you know, a little bit of cushion because if you're putting everything into this idea, if you're a successful 
you know, business person who, let me give you an example. You know, you're a corporate executive, you decide to retire, you have a nice, you know, nice nest egg and you want to become an entrepreneur. Great. You're a celebrity. You want to become great. Well, then you have the means to hire people to help you and to, you know, essentially uh, diversify and, 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 you know, sub out tasks. And then I think, yes, you can have boundaries. What problem, what happens on usual, you know, usually is when it's something you love so much and you're so passionate about, you don't want the boundaries. You eat, sleep, drink it. You know, it's what you love and it's day in and day out. It's, it's your lifestyle. You know, my son once said to me, dad, you don't have any friends. What do you mean I don't have friends? He says, I don't see you hanging out with the neighbors, going out and watching football games and eating pizza with them and blah, blah, blah. I said, I work with my friends, buddy. Those are my friends. <laughs> That's who, and I, and I'm now at a point in my life where I, if you're not a person I enjoy being with, I will actually pass on the business. Uh huh. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's so true. And I think, I think it, this is going back to um, something you mentioned about a family. People always ask, what's the, the perfect work life balance? And, so, you know, sometimes we live in a world that there's no balance. You know, it's, 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 it's a matter of, of sometimes you need to give the business 100%. Sometimes you need to give your family 100%. The question is, if, could you bring in the other party to un have the understanding why you're so focused on the business these days? True. And I think you need to have somebody in your corner that understands it. But I also think that it's very important to treat your personal life as part of your daily calendar. You know, I've had to schedule time to exercise. I've had to schedule time for date night. I've had to schedule time for, you know, calls with my children. I think there's two options. I think, you know, when you're all in, you're all in and nothing else matters. Nothing. That's, you got to be willing to do that. But if you do want to have some semblance of a normal life, you know, I think you can still have that and be, you know, full on in your business, but you have to be very deliberate and intentional about scheduling that time. Hey listeners, are you struggling to create beautiful looking proposals? Is it a hassle every time you need to prepare a quote or proposal for your clients? Is collecting signatures still a manual process? Well, it's time to upgrade to Pandadoc. At PTEX, we use Pandadoc for all our proposals, employee documentation, and so much more. It saves us time, keeps everything organized, and our documents look incredibly professional. With customizable templates, real-time collaboration, and e-signatures, Pandadoc turns creating documents into quick and easy steps. Plus, it integrates with so many other tools, streamlining your workflow and boosting productivity. Try Pandadoc today by visiting ptex.co slash pandadoc and start your free trial. Trust me, it's going to be a game changer for your business. That's ptex.co slash p-a-n-d-a-d-o-c. I want to speak about your time, um, you know, preparing and, and pitching on Shark Tank. Um, was that was that something an intention that you had from day one when you started your business? Is that something an idea at one point that you felt you know what of the sharks could take you to the next level, or was it a fame? Talk about that experience. Yeah, so um, my product was called the Hanukkah tree topper, and it was uh, you know simply put a Jewish star that you put on top of Christmas trees for interfaith families. Came out of a need of my own home. Um, you know, at the time I was married to a woman who was Jewish on her mother's side, but Christian on her father's side. And she wanted to, you know, enjoy the holidays. And for years I said no as a guy who's Jewish. And then one year I said, okay. And, you know, the tree comes home and it has a little five pointed star on top of it. And I said, isn't there a Jewish star for the top of the tree? And it didn't exist. And I said, how can this not exist? And then I looked at the market. I said, okay, fine, let's create this thing. Um, so I, I invented the product um, back in 05 and I was selling it. I think the first time I put it up for sale was in 2010 on Amazon and it exploded. I mean, this thing became the number one. I had no clue, man. I was just doing it for fun. And it became the number one best selling tree topper out of 5,000 tree toppers, the number one best selling ornament out of, um, I'm sorry, Hanukkah present out of 5,000 Hanukkah presents and the 30th best selling ornament out of 300,000 ornaments. I oh, said, wow. there's something here, right? And luckily I patented it and trademarked it and whatever. I sold, I think my first year, like 15,000 units just by putting it on Amazon. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. I didn't, I hadn't even manufactured it yet. And then the next year and the next year I got it here a few more places, whatever. And then I uh, just heard about the show. I was like, that'd be kind of fun. It wasn't all or nothing because that was just a side hustle for me. I was selling software at the time, you know, to big retailers. 
But I said, all right, let's try it out. And I actually auditioned for season four of Shark Tank, which I did through an online, you know, pitch. And I got all the way to the second round. And then they said, nah, you're kind of too small. You know, maybe come back when you have more in sales. And I was very, very, very discouraged. But then the following year comes around. And this is now season five, 2012. And I heard that they were doing auditions uh, locally. I was living in LA and it was, you know, they were down the street. And I said, I'm going to do this again. And my wife at the time was like, you're crazy. Why are you going to do this again? <laughs> you spent so much time, so much energy. You were heartbroken. Why the hell are you doing this again? And I said, because if I don't try, I'll never forgive myself. And so four in the morning, I go sit on a curb. Auditions don't start till 10 because I wanted to make sure I was in line. They only were giving out 500 spots and I was 150 at four in the morning. Wow. And uh, I did it again. And this time I did it in a different way. And, you know, I got through. And here's what the big aha on this whole thing was, um, you know, people don't know the numbers. Uh, 60,000 people try out for Shark Tank every year. 2,500 people make it fast the first round. 900 people do what's called pre-pitch, which means they go to the studio and they pitch their product in front of a room, just like they would the sharks with everything behind them and the whole nine yards, but they're pitching to production staff. Then from that group, 200 come back and actually film. And from that group, only a hundred get the CTV. So it's a hundred out of 60,000, right? Wow. I said to myself, this is not about getting exposure for the Hanukkah tree topper. It's about getting exposure for me. And my goal from the minute I walked onto that stage was if I was lucky enough to be one of those hundred people that aired, I don't care about this. I care about those people in front of me and I care about finding a way to elevate myself and, and be at that level. And honest to goodness, that was my goal from the minute I got out there and that's what I manifested. So it was never, it was never really about the product. It was about, you know, it was about, you know, creating relationships and networking at a, at a very high level. Wow. It's amazing. And I, like, I, I'm actually, I was involved now, in, now we're up to season 16 and I have a, a client of ours that I helped uh, throughout the pitch. They were actually, um, they actually, um, did the full pitch in front of the sharks and like in every step of the way that you mentioned, they kept on saying, it's, you know, we don't confirm they're going to be on the show. You're not going to click. Even he spent hours and hours and hours every step of the way. Oh no. You, you, from the time you audition to the time you film is usually about four or five months. You have weekly calls with the producer every single week where you go through it and then you get on there and they tell you over and over again, until you see yourself on TV, nothing is guaranteed. And then, then you're not even guaranteed you're going to air. <laughs> you're not even guaranteed. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, there's many people who make a deal and then never, you know, never actually air. But what I tell everybody, and I'm lucky enough now, I think I'm the only guy in 16 years to ever work both sides, to ever be on the show and then work for the shark. So I get to go back every single year and I, I'm there when everybody's filming, when they make a deal, I'm the guy who talks to them, you know, and I'm the one that ends up helping them find a home for their product after the fact because of all of my you know retail and whatnot and licensing experience so a lot of the updates you see on shark tank are for me so what i tell everybody when they're there is like no matter what this is a winning lottery ticket even if they make you look like the biggest fool on the planet who cares you're in front of 10 million people as that fool and if you can't find a way to capitalize on that and keep your head on straight then you are a fool <laughs> yeah, if you got that that far in the process. <laughs> so let's let's speak about um in that, you know both sides. So obviously um people people by now know that the pitch is way longer than the the slot that we see on TV. Yeah, it can be anywhere from 30 minutes to two and a half hours and the it's got 16 cameras and you see 8 minutes all chopped up. But yeah, editing is magic. So let's first see big picture. So uh, you go from getting a deal with Damon and then eventually getting to be on the other side. What's that process looking like? Uh <laughs> that was an interesting one for sure. So, uh, you know, once I made the deal, you know, you don't get to talk to Damon after that, right? You talk to his staff, you talk to me, right? And uh, you don't even talk to me these days because I only deal with it after the deal closes, which it takes about six to nine months to do due diligence. So, you, you know, this is it's just a handshake on the show. Does it fall out a lot? A lot of deals fall out in, the, in that pro end of about 30 percent fall. And I'll be honest, the number one reason they fall besides 
just bullshit numbers or they lied about something or whatever. It's just the relationship. Damon doesn't like him. They don't like him. You know, it just, it, you decide you don't really want to be in business with this person. Oh, wow. So with me, what happened was immediately after, you know, he puts me in touch with the licensing person. He says, ah, you know, do you want to license this? Said, Absolutely. Because I, I came from the mentality, I would have given him hundred percent of my company for nothing just to be, you know, in that crew in the, you know, in the mix. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Didn't talk to him for a few months. Finally, I went to New York. I was on other business with my regular software business. And I, uh, you know, it was, it was, uh, right around the holidays and I called the, the licensing person and I said, Hey, I'm going to be in town. I'd love to see you. Oh, actually Damon's in the office. He wants to see you. Oh boy. So there I go, you know, nice little kid from LA to the empire state building. He had the 65th floor and there's a huge FUBU sign on the door. And I walk in and there's a 250 pound receptionist, big, you know, burly guy, where am I? <laughs> and I, I sit and I have this hour long conversation with him. And that was the conversation that just solidified, okay, I'm a normal human being. We kind of like each other. He's like, here's my number. We'll keep in touch. He said, are you willing to license this? Because I really don't want to be in this business. I said, yeah. He says, fine. I will give you access to the licensing agent the attorney. And if we do a deal, you keep all the royalties. I'm not going to give you any money. I'm like, fine, done. So we did that. It actually licensed out to a company called the Kurt Adler company. They're one of the biggest Christmas wholesalers and it's been licensed to them since 2013. And I get, you know, mailbox money every quarter. And that was it. That was the extent of my relationship with Damon. And I went back to selling software. It didn't sit right. It just didn't sit right. So, you know, I kept in touch with him and over the next year, I just did favors for him wherever I could, you know, and that was one of the things my upbringing helped me to is I happened to be very lucky to be around high net worth people, very influential people. I knew respect. I knew, you know, from my career in, in acting, you know, how to read the room, how to know when you're getting a little, cause I'm very aggressive. I can be, but you have to also know when to back off. And, and have patience. Right. And so I was just doing little favors for him. You know, I remember I heard that he invested in an energy drink and I said, Hey, you want me to help you get that into whole foods? You know, he had no idea who I was or what I did in my past. He's like, don't you, mean I, don't you sell tree toppers? I go, <laughs> I've done other things in my life. So I got, I did that for him. I never asked for a thing, never asked for a thing. Then another time I said, hell, you want me to help you build this business plan? I didn't ask for a thing. And then finally, I get an opportunity where I think I got a consulting gig for a thousand dollars or something because they knew I was Damon's guy or whatever. And, can't. and you know what I did? I handed Damon John a multi mega multi multi millionaire, whatever he is. I handed him a check for $200. He said, what the hell is this? I go, well, I got a consulting gig and I figure I get, he's like, kind of looked at me. I go, I know it's small. He says, I think they're going to be bigger in the future. <laughs> and it was that little act that, you know, just, I guess made him feel like I wasn't just a taker, that I appreciated him. But then what happened, which really solidified it was he's one of the most uh, successful keynote speakers in the world. He's probably two in the country, five in the nation, in the world. Incredible, incredible motivational speaker. And he speaks for probably 80 fortune 500 companies a year. And I went to a couple of them. This is about a year after I met him. And I think the one I went to that really opened my eyes was Johnson and Johnson and I'm there and I'm selling software still. And I see him up on stage in front of 3000 people. And he's got this one man keynote play, you know, kind of like what Mike Tyson did back in the day where he talks about his life and everything. And the room's going crazy. You know, you've got 3000 people jumping up and down, laughing, crying. I'm not looking at any of that. I'm looking at the front row. The front row is the C-suite of Johnson & Johnson. CMO, CEO, COO, CSO, you name it, they're there. And they're all like this. And he finishes. And he gets off stage, shakes a couple hands, kisses a few babies, and he's out. What? What are you doing with that row? You know, it was my question. Like, what, what's going on? What do you mean? I said, you have an agency. You want to be the face of brands. Like, do you not have anybody at these events with you besides your DJ back there who's actually cultivating the room? Monetizing those relationships. Said, no, I don't like that. I don't like that. I said, Damon, can I have a shot? He said, what do you mean? I said, let me come with you to a few of these. He's like, 
Don't you have a job? Yes. Don't you sell tree toppers? No. <laughs> he said, what about your job? I said, I'll handle it. He's like, whatever, man, do what you want. I don't care. It's your dime. So I took the risk. And for six months I shadowed him. Oh, wow. My wife thought I was crazy. You know, I was working selling software remotely. So it wasn't like I was having to go into an office every day, but I was getting phone calls going, Hey man, where are you? Why aren't you on this conference call? Or, you know, he would post me on social media and I'd say, Damon, please take that down. My CEO is looking at me like, stop. And for six months, I moonlighted and followed Damon John to his speaking events and, you know, did what I could in those rooms. So what, what, what was your thought process by doing that? Was bring in as much opportunity to the company that I could, you know, bring these relationships in, in order for, you know, the closers to take care of it. Because I'm a relationship guy. So six months go by. And this is the conversation verbatim. He sits me down and he says, I don't understand you. I see where this is going. <laughs> he said, you annoy the living shit out of me. I go, okay. <laughs> But he says in six months, you're responsible for bringing in more incremental revenue to my organization than the 40 people that I have working full time have done in four years. Oh, wow. So go quit your job and get over here. And that's how it happened. Uh, when was that? And I've been with him now, that was 2013. So almost, uh, yeah. It's over 10 years now. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, officially now I'm his head of sales, special partnerships and something we call the shark world. And I just bring in a lot of new business to it. He's one of my best friends and we travel together and have for years. And, um, you know, I, I just, I'm very, very lucky. Wow. So I think for our listeners, uh, if, you know, obviously this was a great story, I think the, what you take out of it is uh, I take out of it at least two main, main points. One is that so, so many people are easy takers than givers. And, and if you flip that around, so much more will come your way. I heard a beautiful quote about that. I it was, if you lead with giving and you just give without thinking, think of it as a deposit into a retirement account. Oh yeah, so true. It'll come back. And isn't that just a better way to spend your days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and the other point I'm taking out of the story is that sometimes you're sitting in a job, but you know your gut feeling that you could do so much more with your life and seek out those opportunities. You know, this, this opportunity wasn't handed over to you. You just saw that opportunity and said, you know what? This is a place where I feel home. Like this is something that connects with your intuition about networking and stuff like that. And then that could lead to some, so much, so much more later on. Yeah. Maybe, you know, um, you know, given your background, um, you're more, probably more observant than me. I think I see it keep on your head, but I, I, I heard once, uh, I think a rabbi once told me the, the gematria of Mazal. I don't remember exactly how the story went, but it was something like, you know, you have the, the M sound, the Z sound, the L sound, right? The different letters, mems, I, whatever it is. And you know, the, that each of the word, each of the letters of the word has a meaning. The, the M is like a building or a house. The Z is something like uh, a clock or a watch. And the L is like a mouth. And so luck is being at the right place in the right time, but that's not enough. You have to open your mouth. Oh yeah. And I think that that's a, you know, a huge testament is that, you know, certain people are just, you know, you see it there, the entrepreneur grabs it and, and is willing to expose themselves and willing to get shot down and insulted and laughed at. If you're not being laughed at, you're not dreaming big enough, you know, and you have to be uncomfortable. So powerful. So I want to get a couple of, I know the, that, uh, We're getting almost out of time, but I want to put in a couple of questions over here, um, which for, for, for our listeners, uh, now that you are on the other side of the aisle and where you see a lot, a lot, first of all, you see what's happening on the show. You also see how deals um, happen or don't happen later on. My observation of the show is you see two types of entrepreneurs. You see those entrepreneurs where they, they were innovative enough. They built a beautiful business or a, a great innovation and the sharks just fight for the product. Then you could see um, the sharks fighting over the person, the people behind the product. And sometimes that means that, you know what, now you're doing tree toppers, but there's so much more. If we have a relationship, there's so much more we could do because I like you as a person. Based on your observation, um, if you need to throw a percentage, 
how, how many of the deals are happening really because of the business and the success of the business versus the entrepreneur, the grid of the entrepreneur and where the entrepreneur could take um, that company from a from an entrepreneur perspective, not so much from the financial perspective? I don't think Shark Tank invests in businesses. They invest in people. You know, you can see the best business on the planet. And when you hear one of the sharks saying, let's license this out, it means we love the business, we don't like you and we're firing you tomorrow. You know, I think it's always comes down to the person. You know, four of the sharks said the same thing about me and they all went out. They said, you're too, this business is too small and you're too good for this business. You know, Damon, thank goodness, was the only one who said, let me take a flyer on this kid. And, you know, he gets asked all the time, what was his most successful investment in Shark Tank? And he always says, from a money standpoint, Bomba Socks is the number one product in Shark Tank history. But he said, from a partnership standpoint, he points to me. And, you know, it's it's incredibly humbling. And uh, but it is I mean, you you know, it's it's kind of like, you know, the resume gets you the interview. But what gets you the job? Do I like you? Do I want to spend the next 10 years of my life sitting five feet away from you, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day? There's so much when it comes to the person and who they are. Can they, you know, do they have a heart? You know, are they all in? I mean, we get so many companies that come on and you can just tell they're there for the publicity. They're just there to take the chance away from somebody who really deserves it. And those people get thrown out immediately. I mean, you know, there's some that the business is just, wow, you know, let me get into this thing. But usually by the time they're on Shark Tank, if it's that good, it's already got, you know, 10 investors. It's already been on Kickstarter and there's just not enough equity to go around anyway. So they those guys a lot of times get shut out because there's just not enough left on the cap table or, you know, they can just sense and smell that they're just there for the publicity. It's always about the person. What would you say? Um, let's speak about a little. Yes, about the business side for a moment. When the team does the due diligence part and. What are the things that you would say you would advise business owners, regardless if they come on the Shark Tank or not, but just as business owners, these are the one, two, three things that you gotta be, you gotta know, you gotta have, you gotta be on top of. You're talking about after. As a business owner in general. Well, from, I mean, you know, when you're on Shark Tank, you're pitching and you have nothing in front of you, right? Nothing. You don't have a note card, you don't have a calculator, nothing. You gotta have it in here and you gotta not bullshit. And the sharks all use techniques on how to sniff out the bull. You know, if you say you've been in manufacturing forever, they'll throw out a term that anybody who's been in manufacturing will know. And if they say, what is that? They know immediately you're full of it. So being honest and doing your homework are probably the two most important things. You know, doing your homework means you got to know your margins in and out. You have to know you know, what you're, what you've based your valuation on, you know, if you come in and say, Oh, my valuation is $10 million and I've done 50,000 in sales. So what are you basing your valuation on then? Oh, well, I have a patent. No, no, no. Like, uh, or we're, we're the market of people that buy uh, drinks. <laughs> exactly. No, I mean that. So I, I mean, and you have to, you have to be able to deliver a pitch in a concise way that everybody can understand. The other thing too, is just honesty. You know, I mean, there's many companies that we do deals with on Shark Tank. When we do the due diligence, we find out stuff that like, oh, well, you owe the IRS a half a million dollars. Why didn't you tell us that? You never asked. What? You know, you now have partners that we didn't hear about. Surprises are never good, ever. So make it very clear that you, I guess what I'm trying to say is Tell the potential investor about all the gophers you have in that beautiful grass before they find them themselves. Because when they find them themselves, they get the stink. They don't want it anymore. And then just remain normal. You know, you get like a lot of people who smell that bug of like, oh, I'm going to get a big investment. I'm going to be on Shark And they become a different person. All of a sudden, now they want to go be like a motivational speaker. <laughs> you know, <laughs> headline Tony Robbins. Like, like, where are you? Yeah. Because all of these guys are shrewd investors, yes, but they're also normal people that like to have, you know, people around them that um, enrich their lives. And then the last thing is what's in it for the person you're pitching? Not what's in it for you, what's in it for them? Because if you keep that focus and you do your homework so that you know what charities they care about, who's in their family, you know, and I get hit up a hundred times a day. Damon probably gets hit up 10,000 times a day. But even I get hit up and, you know, I got people say, oh, I got something. 
how do you know something great for me? Like, did you, you didn't do any work on me. You don't know that I have daughters and you're telling me that I, you know, I've got a great, this product in the world that you're going to love for your boys. I don't have, you know, it's just like, so just, you know, really it's all about, I think, doing your homework, being very honest, humble, and just, you know, keeping your head on straight. In terms of uh, just some insight, if you could share, like, um, obviously, um, there's different personalities on the show. And, and at the end of the day, like you could, you could see sometimes people eyeing for a certain shark versus the other. Um, the end of the day, like all, all sharks at this point have made so many different investment. Does it really make a difference in, in which of the sharks end up investing or like for the success of your, of the company, of the, for the entrepreneur? Well, I think the first step is making sure you err and you can influence whether or not you err by how well your pitch goes and what your relationship is like after you film, because there's several months in between. Things can go wrong. I don't think deciding which shark to go with affects the success of the product the night it airs. The night it airs, you know, 4 million people are going to see it. They're either going to love it or they're going to hate it or they're going to think it's okay. And that's that. The following year, of course, you know, if you want to do something with licensing, you know, Damon's a great choice. If you want to do something with, you know, retail and QVC, Lori's a great choice. If you want to do something with technology, you know, Robert's a great choice. Marketing for women, especially in foods, Barbara's a great choice. You know, but at the end of the day, these are all titans. They're all connected to everybody. They can all pick up the phone and get the answer at least once. So if you're lucky enough to make a deal with any of them, it, it, it blows my mind when I see people walk away when they have a deal on the table. It blows my mind. Wow. Because think about it. It's not the old days of seasons one through four. I don't know if you know this, but seasons one through four, the network used to take a piece of your equity or profit by way of warrant if you got to air. Regardless of the shark, you made it, you didn't make it, the network got to it. That doesn't happen anymore. So now, in theory... You have nothing to lose if you shake somebody's hand. Nothing. Nothing. Why wouldn't you? You know, because, so, you know, I think that that's uh, an important lesson is is that, you know, and and it's still going. Yeah, sometimes ego gets in the way. (laughs) A lot of times ego gets in the way. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about, I know Damon, like, because I get his emails, he's into, like, he does a lot of branding stuff and even educational programs and consulting here and there. Like, tell us a little bit more about that side. Yeah, he's a, I mean, you know, and luckily he's got a great team behind him, but um, one of the programs that he's most focused on right now is something called CEO Access. That's the one that he's most putting all his passion into. And what this is, is for, you know, he's kind of been sort of the brand guy and the consultant for entrepreneurs and celebrities for years and years and years. But what he has switched to and really put his passion into for the last two years is taking successful CEOs and branding them as their own brand. For example, what's the difference between Richard Branson and every other airline CEO and Mark Cuban and every other basketball team owner is that they themselves are brands. Personal brand, yeah, he has a personal brand around. So if if he can help, and he now, you know, he limits himself to like four to five clients, he now has like three or something like that. And you know, it's a hefty, you know, it's not, it's not cheap. You know, you're definitely paying a good amount. But you're getting access, exposure, and an education that very few in this world can get. And why he does it, and what's so important to him, is that when he does it at this level, he's affecting that many more lives in a positive way. One of his clients is a guy who runs a $2 billion a year uh, hearing aid company. And the guy is incredibly successful, but he didn't understand how to do social media. He didn't understand how to do speaking. He didn't understand how to get on, you know, Donnie, you know, on, on, on Squawk Box or, you know, Good Morning America. And he didn't understand how to get a meeting with a guy like Tim Cook or get licensing from Disney. You know, in six months, this guy has gotten all of that. And so that's, that's the program right now. You know, he has all these programs for entrepreneurship at different levels, everything from you can get a one-on-one meeting with him, you know, for 5,000 bucks, 
you know, that goes to charity called the Game Changer Meeting, all the way to CEO access where you're paying, you know, a million dollars a year to have, you know, very exclusive access to him. Um, and, you know, I help, I help, you know, push people along if they want that. I've, I've done a lot of that, but he's just, I don't know what it is, man. I mean, the guy doesn't stop and his, you know, he's called the people shark because he truly is all about educating and, and influencing. And, you know, outside of teaching business, his top two, you know, most important passions in his life are health and longevity. You know, he wants to help people stay healthier longer because, you know, he had a cancer scare and now he's cancer free and, you know, he's focused on health and longevity. And then the second, which is similar to what I talked to you about earlier, is educating children on, on finances because, you know, he wrote a book called Little Damon Learns to Earn and it went number one on Amazon of all titles for like the first week. And that's out of what millions of titles. And it's specifically targeting fourth to eighth graders on just the, the basic fundamentals of money. Beautiful. Yeah, this, uh, we, we covered a lot and then obviously um, we're running out of time. So for our listeners, <laughs> the links resources mentioned in the show, uh, check out the show notes at www.ptexgroup.com slash podcast. We will link um, to see more about the stuff we discussed. Let's close with the four rapid fire questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. Number one, a book that changed your life. Who moved my cheese? Great book. Number two, a piece of advice you got that you'll never forget. If you don't love your work, don't do it. Good one. Number three, anything you wish you could go back and do differently? No, because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of mistakes that I've made, but, you know, I found that those mistakes and those bottoms ended up being my trampoline. Beautiful. I think, you know, I'll get a little, a little, uh, faith on here, but, you know, I think, you know, God has a plan and it's perfect. And, you know, if we, if we look back and have regrets, then it's just a waste of energy. Take whatever happened and just make, make it better, you know, have, take the lesson from it. There's no, there's no, there's no success. I mean, there's no failing. There's just learning and success. So true. And last and final question, what's still on your bucket list to achieve? To be a great father a better father. Beautiful. Uh, Morty, thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. That is why in the name of our listeners, we'll forever be grateful for sharing some of your time with us today. It's been a blast. My pleasure, Manny. No problem. Thanks for the conversation. Thank you. That's my conversation with Maury. My takeaway from this one, number one, learning from mentors and industry icons can provide invaluable guidance in one's entrepreneurial journey. Mentors offer experience-based insights and advice that can accelerate personal professional growth. Number two, Maury emphasizes the importance of authenticity in building lasting business relationship. Genuine interactions foster trust and loyalty, which are essential for sustainable success. Number three, a strong support system, both personally and professionally, is integral to entrepreneurial success. Maury's experience illustrates how surrounding oneself with supportive individuals can provide encouraging advice and resources during challenging times. Number four, insight from industry icons like Kevin O'Leary and Mark Cuban emphasizes the necessity of balancing professional ambitions with personal life. Achieving this balance is critical for long-term success and personal well-being. And number five, Maury's journey is a testament to the power of resilience, demonstrating how maintaining a strong and adaptable mindset can help navigate both personal and professional obstacles. This quality enables individuals to preserve in the face of setbacks and continuing striving towards their goals. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Let's Look Business podcast. I hope you enjoyed the practical, no-nonsense advice that our guests shared. If you found value in listening, I would be so grateful if you could share the episode with your friends and if you could give the show a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever platform you listen. Subscribe to the show and get notified every time we publish a new episode. The Let's Talk Business Podcast is a P-Tex Group original production. Until next time, make it a great day.